Hello, and welcome to the EV and Mobility Panel at the ninth Annual Gateway Conference. Thank you to everyone joining us today. My name is Tom Colton. I'm a director at Gateway Investor Relations, as well as lead our firm's EV practice. My co-moderator today is Matt Glover, Senior Managing Director of Gateway's Technology, Media, and Telecommunications Practice. As a bit of background and a little plug for our firm, Gateway Investor Relations is a strategic financial communications and capital markets advisory firm. For over two decades, Gateway has provided strategic consulting, corporate messaging and positioning, investor awareness, and analyst and financial press coverage for its collective hundreds of clients. For the past nine years, we've hosted our annual Gateway Conference with the goal of connecting great emerging growth companies with the top institutional investors in the small cap landscape. Today, we've had over 700 public and private growth companies, as well as thousands of institutional investors, sell side analysts, and sponsoring investment bankers attend this conference. And we're appreciative to everyone joining us this year for our virtual format. For today's panel, we have a great lineup with some of the early leaders in the fast growing electric vehicle and mobility industries. Our discussion today will touch a lot of different areas, but we'll be taking a closer look at some of the different approaches being taken to address current obstacles to widespread EV adoption, as well as the future direction of personal mobility. I'd now like to introduce our panelists for today. From Workhorse Group, we have CEO Dwayne Hughes. Representing Electromechanica, we have CFO Bal Bueller. And from Last Mile Holdings, we have CEO Max Smith. Now, before we jump into questions, I'd like to pass the mic over to each of our panelists to provide some background on themselves, as well as their respective companies. Going in that same order, Dwayne, let's start with Workhorse. Dwayne, you're on mute. <laughs> Who didn't know that was going to happen? <laughs> uh, thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. Um, I'm looking forward to having, having our discussion today. But for those who aren't familiar with Workhorse, we are a last mile delivery technology company. Our technology is focused on around the development and manufacture of electric vehicles, as you mentioned before, but specifically for the final mile commercial fleets. Uh, these vehicle platforms include both trucks and drones, so whether they've got wheels on them spinning down the road or rotors spinning in the air, our technology is designed to help our workhorse fleet customers, you know, improve efficiencies and reduce operating costs, you know, and provide them competitive advantages to help them increase revenue and grow market share. But we definitely recognize our role and our responsibility, you know, to protect our natural environment and our fellow humans' health all while driving this innovation and helping to change the way the world works. I'll pause there. Awesome, thank you, Dwayne. Uh, Val, over to you at Electromechanica. Uh, thanks so much, Tom and Matt, for, for having us here on this panel and, and part of the, con the conference. Uh, I've been with Electromechanica for just under two years. Uh, Electromechanica is a Canadian designer and manufacturer of electric vehicles. We are revolutionizing and redefining transportation as it was in the past to where it is now and to where it will be in the future. Uh, this is all about this transportation solo ecosystem where we've developed this drive solo campaign where it goes everywhere from urban commuting to delivery and to shared mobility. We are truly disrupting the space. We're um, very unique and dynamic and incomparable in three distinct ways from our peers in the sector because of our product design, which is the Solo. It's the three-wheeled three single-seat vehicle. Uh, we have an asset light production model and our launch strategy is very, very unique in terms of how we're rolling out the Solo. Um, and we've created this Solo ecosystem and we're so proud to say that we have finally hit a milestone for the company where we just started production and the solos are truly coming. Uh, just a, a little brief background about myself. I've got uh, over 25 years of diversified financial and business and risk management experience, either as an executive and or a board director in both public and private companies. Um, some of the ind industries that I've uh, been involved in have been technology, automotive, manufacturing, e-commerce, blockchain, resource, uh, transportation, energy, and um, health and wellness. So um, I bring a different uh, diverse background when it comes to uh, uh, 
uh, IPOs, reverse takeovers, um, risk management, product development, investor relations, marketing, and a whole slew of other things. So um, thank you again, and I'll hand it over to Tom. Awesome, thanks, Val. Uh, and Max, can you provide our listeners with a bit of background on Last Mile, as well as maybe an explanation on your relationship to Gotcha Mobility? Great. Um, Max Smith, I'm CEO of Last Mile Holdings. Last Mile is really um, the combination of two companies. Originally, Ojo Electric, which I was running as a, um, it was originally a retail electric scooter company. And I uh, transformed that company into a mobility company, a ride shares company for scooters. Uh, we merged that company into a public shell through an RTO back in October, and then subsequently purchased Gotcha Mobility. And gotcha being a mobility company providing bike and scooter share services for the past 11 years. Um, with the conclusion of that acquisition, we changed the public company name to Last Mile Holdings and have merged all of our rideshare operations onto the Gotcha platform, that tech platform, which is also now the consumer facing interface and consumer facing app. So through, the, through Gotcha, we offer bike and scooter rideshare services in the United States. Typically, um, we operate a little differently than many of the mobility companies in this space. Um, we operate principally exclusive contracts. We have 80 contracts, 35 are with universities and 45 with municipalities. Exclusivity is critically important to our success. So unlike many companies, we never followed blitz scaling. We didn't want to raise more capital than anyone and be in every city on a global basis. We launch cash positive markets. We have superior unit economics and we're able to get exclusive contracts by offering a multimodal solution. We're not simply bikes or scooters, we offer both. And we're looking to add other EV solutions to our platform as we're getting a lot of inbound interest from a lot of great electric vehicle manufacturers. Um, prior to joining Last Mile or Ojo Electric, I had completed my uh, eighth exit. I've um, worked typically um, as CFO, COO, C uh, um, CEO, uh, raising capital, building value, and ultimately um, exiting companies. I've had four exits in the media space, two ad tech, one in mobility where I sold national car rental um, while doing the m and for General Motors and also a KKR roll-up, which um, ended in an IPO with World Color Press. Back to you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, for the rest of today's discussion, I'd like to orient our conversation broadly around three key topics. First is going to be the path to production. Uh, the EV and mobility landscape is becoming increasingly crowded with new players, it seems like, almost every day. Beyond just having an idea, what does it take to physically build a vehicle and to do so sustainably at scale? Second is infrastructure needs. So beyond if you build it, they will come. Uh, what else is needed to support larger scale adoption of EV and alternative mobility solutions? How will you support charging for consumer and commercial applications? What strategic partnerships are essential to ensure that you can meet the demand you hope to drive? And then third is the future of mobility. Put simply, where are we going from here? Once we're done, and if there's hopefully some time left over, we'll turn the discussion over to live Q&A from some of our listeners. Recognizing we're on a tight clock here, uh, I'll kick it off with our path to production segment. Val, beginning with you, now that you've officially begun production, what does that process look like from now until deliveries in the fall, and how are you ensuring vehicle quality and timelines are being met? Um, in terms of our, our production aspect, I mean, we've just launched production, um, which just essentially started at the end of August. And in terms of what we're doing and how we're able to meet those demands, you know, we've got, um, we're, we just really did a press release this week where we showed the production facility, um, the solos coming down the, the production line. Um, those are then being put onto containers from China and coming into North America, where we will be doing our post delivery inspections to ensure the safety and the reliability of the solo so that it provides a safe and reliable and cool driving experience. You know, we've been very diligent in executing on the business plan on going into production and then looking forward and putting those keys into the hands of our customers. So we are really um, very strategic in how we're doing the launch. Now that we are in production, we've changed the landscape of the company 
of going from a pre-production company and, and to a production company. So right now it's really vital that, that the, the dream that started in 2015 has now come to fruition at the end of August. And so we're, we're very cautious and um, also wanting to ensure that giving, getting the customers in and getting those first keys out is being done in a strategic manner so that we're also there um, being able to nurture our new customers that are going to have the new solos. Thanks, Belle. Uh, that's a great overview. And I think it's a, a nice segue into a question for Dwayne here. Dwayne, now that you're a, a couple months into production for the C-Series, your next gen last mile delivery vehicle, can you describe for our audience what actually goes into getting ready for uh, production on your end and what infrastructure did you need to have in place prior to starting? How has that developed since then? How are things moving? Uh, great question, Tom. I appreciate it. Um, not to sound facetious, but first, it's a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and capital that go into getting production ready, right? Uh, but more specifically, you know, here at Workhorse, our approach to the C-Series production, which is our second generation electric delivery truck, has been really to capture, you know, uh, the more than five years of learnings we've gained from our generation one trucks that have more than six million real life delivery miles on them, having delivered many millions of packages, right, and learning that customer's pain and so on. But again, it's not just about the vehicle learnings, it's about learning the business of our customer, right? Where we better understand their pain, as I called it before, if you will. You know, once we understand their pain, how our vehicles perform, that gives us many different differentiators and using all of these learnings and applying them to our production focused engineering and design is really the key to success. So I can't express enough that it's, it's as much about knowing their business and the pain they're experiencing in their business and what problems we are trying to help them solve, right? But um, I think the second part of your, your question was, you know, what infrastructure do we need in place? What do we have in place? How's it developing? So, you know, we're fortunate that back in 2013, you know, we acquired our assembly complex from Navistar International. And at that time, Navistar was producing about 150 medium duty truck chassis in the combustion engine format, of course, for both the delivery and the RV business at that time. And I think that started in the late 90s. So they produced tens of thousands of chassis out of that facility. So our initial generation one design really piggybacked on those, if you will, medium duty class five type chassis where we would in integrate our electric powertrain um, and take advantage of all of, the all of the offerings that facility had available to it. So from that perspective on generation one, we had very little capital that was required to uh, retool the plant to make it an effective assembly complex for our gen one vehicles. Now, taking all of those learnings I just discussed after all of those miles and all of those packages, you know, we've had to really think about how we design our generation two vehicles to not require a lot of capital to retool the existing plant, but to repurpose the existing plant and complex, allowing us to achieve our goals, right? Uh, but I could tell you that even though we have, you know, a very, it's, it's a manual plant process that doesn't have a lot of robotics and so on. So from an automation perspective, as we want to scale from a few units a day let's call it to 40 or 50 units a day, we recognize automation is gonna be a key to that, uh, whether that's robotics or other types of automation involved. So we see the opportunity, should we want to use our Union City facility and enhance and retool it with robotics and so on? Or of course, you know, we have recently announced, I'll say that we have a sister company called Lordstown Motors. And of course, Lordstown acquired the General Motors complex in Lordstown, Ohio, which is a six plus million square foot facility that has 2000 robots and all kinds of automotion, auto automation, I apologize. So I, I do believe that, you know, we're looking at beyond our own capability in house and looking at outsourced production activities and so on. But I think Ball said it really well from the, from the pers perspective of trying to remain asset light. So we're really using this precious capital that we have 
to build and design uh, great products for you know, our customers that will be on the road that are, to her point again, that are very safe, but also reliable and really fulfill the vision of what we told them they would get when they buy our vehicles. I will say this, uh, you know, we also recently announced a partnership with Hitachi Group of companies um, who has, they've begun an operational assessment for us uh, to give us the best practice recommendations, if you will, to take on manufacturing at Union City, again, from say five a day to 40 a day or so. Um, they've done this for multiple companies over the years, and you know we'll use these recommendations to evaluate our options for mass production going forward. Thanks, Dwayne. That's that's really helpful, uh, Max. Let's take it over to you. So people may understand uh, your business better through the lens of some larger players like a Bird and Lime, but you obviously do a lot more than just those scooters. Uh, can you speak to how you're different? And I know you talked about this at the outset. Maybe you'll go a little bit further. Uh, talk about the unique, more deliberate go-to-market approach you've taken and how that ties into your current manufacturing process for all of the different modalities that you provide. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so we differ in a variety of ways. Um, most of the large companies in this space, Bird and Lime, as you've mentioned, have raised a billion dollars each and have typically relied on one, uh, one scooter, the stand-up scooter, uh, kick scooter. Uh, as their means of, uh, of operating and deploying. They've also deployed a, a go-to-market strategy of blitzscaling, raise more money than anyone, be in every city, put dots on the map and build the defensible moat. Um, I met with many VCs from both of those companies um, who all told me you need hundreds of millions of dollars to plant your flag around the world and, and get deployed everywhere. And we wholeheartedly rejected that. We actually um, have a different strategy a strategy based on multimodal approach where we integrate bikes, e-bikes, stand up and sit down scooters. And we think the importance here is to uh, develop a go-to-market strategy partnering with both universities and municipalities that um, goes through exclusive contracts. And that's a big difference. So rather than be everywhere, we wanna be in the port and places, which um, for us is the often overlooked middle market city. Baton Rouge, Mobile, Charleston, uh, universities like LSU, Alabama, Michigan State, and Syracuse. By approaching them with a multimodal product suite, we satisfy all of their mobility needs. And as we know, no city and no two universities are alike. So you need flexibility in solutions. And with that approach, we've been able to um, uh, secure 80 contracts, 35 with the universities, 45 with the municipalities, 80% of which are exclusive, and the average tenure on our contract is over three years. For us, that's created an opportunity for really superior unit economics. We're the only one who operates in that city or university, so our focus is on the mobility solution not trying to compete with someone, another scooter or bike company who's deploying assets across the street. So it's a, it's a different approach. Um, we have a different manufacturing facilities for uh, different um, uh, types of mobility, modality, um, but we've also integrated into our operations um, operational efficiencies. Our vehicles have swappable batteries. Our very first deployment in Austin, Texas of January, 2019 was a swappable battery. Our scooters, stand-up scooters, and e-bikes will have the same swappable battery. So it's a different approach, requires less capital, more targeted, a rifle approach rather than a shotgun. For us, to date, uh, we've had superior unit economics. We're really pleased with our progress, and uh, we're going to stick with that strategy. Awesome, Max. Thank you. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Matt to MC our next discussion topic. Thanks, Tom. That provides a nice segue into the next topic of business models. As many of you know, business models in the EV space are wide ranging and vary by company and go to market strategy. Uh, on the one side of the spectrum, you have companies like Canoe and Electromechanica that are leveraging an asset light model. Uh, perhaps, Val, maybe starting with you, um, you know, talk about the asset light model and sort of the associated benefits. Sure. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, in terms of an asset like model, what we started to think about in the early days, <clears throat> excuse me, is how do we uh, mitigate against production risk? 
how do we keep our capital expenditures low so that we're not burning through tens and millions of dollars on a monthly basis and then having to continually raise large amounts of capital? Why reinvent the wheel at the end of the day? So what, what we decided to do is let the leaders who understand mass scale production, who build millions and millions of uh, vehicles on an annual basis, who have the facilities and we don't have to put the money into that type of an infrastructure, be our partner. And so what we did was we partnered up with Zongshen, which is one of the largest motorcycle manufacturers in the world. They build anywhere from 2 million plus motorcycles a year, along with 50 international JVs um, all over the world. And so because the facility that they have, we've got a dedicated facility, uh, approximately 160,000 square feet uh, in Chongqing, China, where this is all dedicated to the production of the solos. That facility in itself has the capacity to build out uh, sorry, manufacture uh, 20,000 solos a year if, if we wanted to. And then there's additional capacity that we could add on and even increase that if we wanted to. Um, so having an asset like manufactured model meant that we didn't have to put money into a uh, building. We didn't have to put money into employing thousands of employees. We, at, we do have our own team there. Um, we have our own engineering quality control team in at, at the manufacturing facility uh, with Zogshan. Uh, we also have um, our own tooling and molds that we own, uh, but all the other aspects of what goes on in the assembly and the supply chain aspects, they're doing right now. But um, in addition to that, even though we've, we've looked at it from a, um, a risk perspective, yes, um, they are being produced in China right now. We're also looking at a new facility here in the US, uh, which is now um, down to three finalists, which is the state of Arizona, uh, state of Tennessee and state of Florida. And what that will allow us to do, so yes, I was talking about mitigating against production risk and capital. This is still gonna be an assembly facility, still on the asset light um, model. But what that's gonna allow us to do is we're gonna be able to get these simple kits um, made from our partner. And they would be sent to us here in the US. We would do our own supply chain. So again, we're mitigating against other multiple factors of whether it be tariffs, whether it be supply chain, risks and, and making sure that we've got the solo that is not going to be exposed to these international risks all around. And by having a solo made in America, we are in control of that. We'll also be able to contribute to the economy. So we'll be creating jobs, both directly and indirectly. We'll be putting cash flow into the state and then obviously into the country, which then has an economic impact in a very positive way and contributes to the GDP. So in essence, sorry for the long-winded answer, um, but it is, it's a two-fold answer in terms of, yes, we have our manufacturing facility in China right now, but we look at it from a holistic perspective. That's great, thanks for the insights. One of the biggest perceived issues to wide-scale EV adoption is the lack of infrastructure to support charging and maintenance. Dwayne, maybe you can speak to some of the creative ways Workhorse has been able to address these barriers to adoption. Hmm. Thanks, Matt. Um, that's a great question because I would tell you that, you know, infrastructure is more than a perceived issue. It's a real issue. And I'll describe why in a moment, but I'll leave you with the importance that we found in really aligning ourselves with experienced companies and people who understand infrastructure um, and, you know, up to and including everything from the disposal of the battery at end of life, if you will, for the vehicle, and or perhaps more importantly, the secondary use capabilities that those batteries can bring for other industries. So uh, companies like Duke Energy, who we formed an alliance with more than a year ago, uh, the alliance I mentioned before with Hitachi, as well as Ryder, and, and many more, but those, those three particularly are very well experienced and skilled at you know, the, the business of infrastructure. Now, why is infrastructure so important? As you might, you know, at the, and I think Tom alluded to this earlier, perhaps, but, you know, buying the truck is one thing, but if I can't fill it up with all of the juice it needs to go out on route the next day, it doesn't do me any good. 
but it's really much beyond that because if you think of it from this perspective, um, the average house in America uses 30 kilowatt hours of energy a day. A medium duty truck that weighs, call it 20,000 pounds fully loaded, technically 11,000 pounds empty, right? Uh, requires, and a fleet wants it to trail, we'll call it 100 to 150 miles. That takes a minimum of 120 kilowatt hours of battery energy on board. And so first and foremost, 120 kil kilowatt hours based on 30 kilowatt hours of use per household per day, that's the equivalent of four households every night that has to be charged. And if you're a fleet that has 200 of these vehicles in a depot, all of a sudden you got to light up 800 households at night to get enough energy for them to go out on their route the next day. So then you compare that and you say five years ago in March of 2015, I'll put it this way, we delivered our first two electric trucks. At that time, batteries cost about $1,000 a kilowatt hour. So 120 kilowatt hours on board a vehicle to make it go 100 miles represented $120,000 worth of cost. And as we all know, as important as sustainability is to the environment and so on, fleets will not, unless it pencils out for them, fleets are not likely to adopt electric vehicles at scale until they make sense financially, as well as they demonstrate proof of performance and reliability and safety that we talked about before. But as far as infrastructure goes, the battle is really figuring out how to right size the battery pack meaning this, how do I build a vehicle that will still do that 150 miles a day, but instead of having four households worth of energy on board, I can put 60, 70 kilowatt hours of energy on board, you know, one or two households worth of energy and make it available for its route. So as Max said before, having configurable battery packs that allow us to put the right amount of energy on board a truck for a very specific route but then allows that fleet to add to or take away from that configuration based on the duty cycle or the route that that truck's on. So in general, you know, infrastructure is an issue. We got to get enough pipe into the building, but we got to be smart about that pipe because we just don't want to oversize the pipe. We want it to be the right size pipe, like the right size battery pack. So we can use the smart charging services that are available to us to recognize which truck needs how much energy so we can stagger uh, the charging times and so on. So there's a there's a whole business behind infrastructure, and it is a real key to getting fleets to adopt these vehicles at scale. Thanks, Dwayne. And and Max, maybe can you talk about the infrastructure needed on your end to deploy a new location, and then you know how quickly can you get that up and running? I'm still recovering from Dwayne's math. Um, but you know, there's going to be math involved today. But thank you for that, Dwayne. Sure. Um, so our, our infrastructure needs uh, uh, vary depending on, on the mobility device. We can stand up a scooter market in 30 days. So um, there, we're getting a warehouse um, and we use virtual docking. So there's no physical requirement. Um, we don't charge in the field. We have swappable batteries. And so again, it's building, um, finding the warehouse that has enough power source, of course, because we've, we're, we're charging batteries all day, sending them out in the vehicles to swap batteries. Um, we have uh, vehicle rebalancing requirements. So that's, that's just uh, vehicles to move around and, and transport vehicles to maintain the proper infrastructure and, and balance. Um, and then e-bikes or even pedal bikes require a bit more infrastructure. That infrastructure is for docking stations. Uh, you want to put in docking stations that create order out of chaos. We're, we're not, although our scooters, both stand up and sit down, um, are free floating. Uh, with bikes, you can't end an e-bike ride without uh, going to a, a docking station. What we like to do, and so that requires usually months, and it's months because you're talking with city officials, city urban planning specialists, and our own city planning team using years of data that, we, that we've that we seen effective with our heat maps where mobility tends to start and stop. And those, by the way, those uh, are Mondays, different than Saturdays, different than Tuesday. So you have to understand all those needs. And that's the physical infrastructure that's required. Um, so it's a lot of urban planning, coordination with city officials, building of physical docks, and then also on the back end, 
we create virtual docking stations for our free floating devices. If you want to end a scooter ride, it has to be near a docking station. And that'll be through our uh, geofencing, which tells a rider that it's okay to, to ride in one place versus another. Other things that we are looking at, um, other, other scooter companies have created uh, charging stations for batteries where the actual physical structure is in the field and you can swap batteries there. Um, we haven't deployed that yet. We're looking at many models uh, like that. We have other um, formats uh, of electric vehicles, both motorcycles and, and mopeds who are now talking to us about joining our platforms. So that's a little bit more infrastructure involved. But um, so, you know, going multimodal, there are different needs and uses, various degrees of, of uh, infrastructure necessary, whether it's a bike, a scooter, stand up or sit down. Great, thanks, Max. Many believe that the future of micro, or excuse me, mobility is micro mobility, which obviously isn't a new concept by any means, but its adoption within urban landscapes is gaining a ton of traction lately. Um, you know, Max, maybe another one for you outside of your core market. Do you see any other possibility of future expansion? Expansion out of our markets, our core markets now? Correct. Uh, well, I, I would say. Um, We've got a lot, a long way to go with our existing uh, uh, delivery against our, our schedule. We've got 35 markets launched. We've got uh, 80 contracts signed. So we have a lot of blocking and tackling, and we're, we're really focused on delivering on, on the multimodal uh, university and mobility solutions. We have opportunities um, to expand and expand not only moving people from point A to point B, but also the movement of, of, uh, of parcels, of packages, the delivery of food. And so expansion for us is taking advantage of our network that exists today. Our e-bikes and our seated scooters are terrific vehicles for the delivery of food. We did a pilot for eight months in Austin, Texas, with one of the largest food delivery companies who used a fleet of 25 Ojo scooters or our cruiser scooter, as we call it now. Um, they noted that on average, the delivery person would travel 34 miles a day doing deliveries, and it was 35% more efficient using our electric vehicles than any other form factor, car or bike. Car, you're having difficulty finding parking near a restaurant and a bicycle. You don't have the ability to travel as far. So expansion from us, expansion for us outside of what we do today is probably um, leveraging the existing infrastructure, recognizing that our vehicles can be used for the delivery of um, food, the delivery of parcels, in addition to moving people around from point A to B. And I think that's an extension of what we do today that doesn't require uh, significant or any investment really. It's just enabling delivery people to access the vehicles. And in a way, Electromechanic is working to change how consumers and businesses view mobility. Uh, Val, can you speak to the Drive Solo movement and what your long-term goal is for wide-scale adoption, as well as how it ties to your plans for the solo ecosystem? Sure. Um, thanks, Matt. Uh, so in terms of a holistic approach, and previously I mentioned about the solo ecosystem and where that has three distinct um, business segments. So one is on the urban commuting, the second one is on um, uh, commercial applications with fleets and deliveries. And the third one is more of like a subscription type of uh, share program. So each one of those has a distinct name. One is called Solo Drive, which is just for a purpose. Uh, and remembering that the solo, and I'm talking about the solo ecosystem, this is a purpose-built system. So it is for a single seat driver and um, a single occupant, and it's um, providing a purpose and it's purpose built. So it's in the middle of micro mobility on one side, uh, something that Max has been talking about, and as well as on the passenger side where, um, where you're not using um, most of the time, 76% of the time, you're generally doing a lot of stuff solo. You're driving by yourself most of the time um, lots of things that we do now are solo. So if we look at the solo as being a purpose-built solution, and then you look at it from a holistic perspective between urban commuting and commercial applications, it has this circle. So you can either use it 
for um, your own personal use. Businesses could be using it for deliveries and um, and for um, university campuses or any any aspect where there is a need of having multiple vehicles in a in a fleet. Um, and then you have this solo share program, which again could be for um, for anybody. Again, especially during these times right now, there's a lot of people that might not want to own a vehicle, might not want to take public transit, might not want to do Uber, for example, just because of the, the conditions right now, where if you are on the subscription-based program, you can then freely go into it, know that it's going to be sanitized after, and then do what you need to do. So that's part of this solo ecosystem. Now, how we're, um, there's different ways of how we're launching that on the urban commuting side we've got the retail kiosks that we have um, we've got centuries uh, beverly hills we that one's already been open we will be opening one in sherman oaks la pretty soon as well as we've got one in scottsdale arizona and then in washington square mall, mall, mall sorry um, just outside of uh, portland oregon and so that is um, one of the ways that we're also um, increasing the awareness. We're also trying to educate um, people and companies in terms of what the solo is all about. And so we've launched a very aggressive uh, marketing campaign, both on digital and on traditional advertising. And that's about this drive solo um, to educate uh, the various aspects about the solo. So for example, We've put in a lot of engineering and safety features for the solo that are very different. And we've taken our time to make sure that it is safe and reliable. Again, what Dwayne's been talking about, he wants to ensure that the customers feel safe and reliable. And so um, having done that, we've we've got multiple features in there, such as you know, torque limiting control, triple side protection. Uh, we've got front and rear crumple zone protection. We've got a roll bar. We've got a wider stance. You know, we want to make sure that the driving experience is also is cool, but at the same time, you feel safe and reliable. So, um, in order to educate consumers and businesses, it's important that that message gets out. And so that's why we've now launched a more of an aggressive campaign towards Drive Solo and educating the consumers on that. Um, and then essentially providing that holistic perception of what the solo ecosystem is, is all about and including infrastructure when it comes to the charging aspects. So you can do it for two ways. You can just plug it into a regular 110 or you can charge it with a, a level two. But again, this is an exciting time for us and we're new. Um, and we're wanting to ensure that the message that we're getting across is the right message. It is towards this minimalist movement. And again, it doesn't compete with uh, a lot of the companies out there. We're, we're actually a complement to everything else that's being done. Thanks, Bell. Dwayne, can you spend some time talking about how you're thinking about incorporating drone deliveries into your current operations as well as other applications? And then, you know, maybe more broadly, where do you see the future of delivery going? Thanks, Matt. Again, uh, another good question. Um, the answer really is yes, I can spend a lot of time talking about it. But uh, given we're under some time limitation here, I'll, I'll stay with that broad approach that you talked about. But first, I'm going to borrow from John Graver, who leads our aerospace division. Right? He has this up. But he recently said that last mile transportation is hard. Aerospace transportation is harder and it, integrating the two is even harder than both of those, right? And so, as I mentioned before, we have trucks, electric trucks on the road since 2015 that have massed more than 6 million miles, right? We've also, since sometime in 2018, flown our horsefly delivery drone, which is integrated with our delivery truck, but also can operate from a fixed base of operations such as a storefront and so on, but we've flown many hundreds of live package delivery missions in those models. In addition to some work we did in Virginia a couple of months ago that followed the COVID announcement where we were invited to participate in flying from the 
from the government perspective of how might drones be used to help, uh, I'll say, fight COVID-19 in this particular case, right? What's becoming commonly known as touchless delivery. They want that package to be touched by as few humans as possible in, in that delivery process. But come back to incorporating it into our current operation. We initially started the drone delivery integration into the truck because at, at the base level, a medium duty combustion engine vehicle costs in fuel and maintenance alone, no driver time, et cetera, about $1 per mile to drive. Given the ROI, the total cost of ownership savings of a workhorse electric vehicle, what we've been able to find is that we can bring that cost from a dollar down to around 40 cents a mile. But in reality, a drone, and think of it in terms of integrating the two and leveraging both you know, to do the mission at hand, we can use a drone to fly for less than four cents a mile. So imagine the scenario where a driver pulls up to a red light, they have a delivery one mile to their left, instead of turning left, going down and making that delivery, they hand the bird the package that goes one mile to their left, it autonomously goes there, delivers to the specific location. Meanwhile, the delivery driver turns right on red, right? Continues on their route. The drone relocates the truck, remarries with the truck and is ready for another package. So we looked at that from the perspective of all of the economics of it, where fleets have come out and said, if they could reduce even one mile per day by driving a 20,000 pound delivery truck around, they could reduce their operating fuel and maintenance costs by tens of millions of dollars a year. So that problem that was, or that pain, as I referred to earlier, that was brought to us, you know, was the beginnings of us designing a system, which again would be integrated with that truck to complement what that driver is doing in the delivery process. So from our perspective, the future right, will be a combination of the two. And again, whether they're launched from vehicles, although we have the patent on truck launch drone delivery, um, or whether they're launched from storefronts, we can supplement what a truck's doing. Then you can think about the aspects of, you know, the hundreds of thousands of combustion engine vehicles that are out there spewing out emissions today. Of course, our drone being an all electric drone has no emissions either, right? So, uh, we can reduce the number of these vehicles that are on the road, but importantly, to get there and do that, right, it requires regulatory issues, the FAA type certification process specifically. So in order to use a drone for commercial purposes, right, and also have meaningful long-term commercial revenue, your bird has to be type certified in order to be legally allowed to fly in the air and do commercial deliveries. So we're entering that FAA type certification process, right? And we'll partner with other companies out there who have what's called their, um, uh, well, they have a certification process as well that they go through as the actual carrier, right? And then like our trucks, we will integrate our truck and our drone technology into those delivery fleets where they can uh, maximize the efficiencies today and achieve both the ROI and total cost of ownership savings, as well as the safety that comes along with using a bird in the sky as opposed to a vehicle on the road. Thanks, Dwayne. We're gonna take a question from the audience that's applicable to all three of our panelists. The question is, if we fast forward two years from now, how should we judge success for you? And what does your competitive landscape look like? Uh, let's start with Max. Well, two years from now, certainly well before then, we expect to be profitable. That we actually expect to be profitable in the near future. Um, that's a big statement for the micro mobility space when companies like Bird and Lime have raised a billion dollars and have, have blown through that capital. Um, the landscape will be, um, it's very fragmented today. I expect to see consolidation in the industry. Um, I, I think we're on the right path. I think exclusivity is really important, deep, integrated partnerships with universities and our municipal partners. And so, you know, I, I think it's a, a bike share has been around for a long time. People think of scooter share or micro mobility starting in September of 17 when, when Bird launched a thousand scooters in the middle of the night in Santa Monica. 
bike share is an old business model, but it's evolving and it's evolving to adopt and accept electric models, charging models. So we'll see efficiency in charging. We'll see greater range. We'll see um, uh, uh, longer lasting vehicles and, um, and we'll see integration of other goods and services on the platform. Today, we operate a network, a mobility network, which moves people from point A to B. That network will expand to a platform. And on a platform, you'll have more goods and services, not only moving goods and services, but buying and sales of goods and services, connecting people to retail. So I think there's a very broad vision where, that we can go to that goes beyond mobility, goes beyond, um, into sort of more of a commerce model. And um, I think it'll be propelled with further technological developments for further use cases, better quality uh, vehicles, uh, longer lasting batteries and quicker charge. Thanks, Max. Um, Val, how do we judge success for electric mechanical? And the second part of that question is, what does the competitive landscape look like? Um, in terms of Electromechanica and, and its success, uh, the way that we look at it is that we've just come out of the gate. For us, it's important that uh, consumers and businesses understand and are educated and we, and we do the proper education when it comes to the solo um, and what it's there for, what, what this purpose is, and actually being very successful in this whole holistic approach of the solo ecosystem, which again goes into the three segments of, of our business and including the charging infrastructure as well. Um, there will be other, uh, another iteration of the solo that we will be launching as well. And that would then be more of the global international uh, vehicle, which would be going into Europe, Southeast Asia, Latin America. So it will be the true global vehicle that we will be able to launch. Um, the solo right now for us, it's basically proving our credibility in the market um, on the streets. And, and making sure that we do the right, do it properly and, um, and are successful in that. Uh, the times are also changing right now. So as, as, as is the um, thought of where the use of the solo is going to be. So uh, as I had mentioned before, we're in different times right now. Our conferences are virtual. Our um, meetings are becoming virtual. Uh, I don't know. Uh, when we're going to be able to have face-to-face -face meetings again. So because the, the world is changing and evolving, so are we. We're all adapting to different aspects of, of the world and, and, and we're able to adapt very quickly. Um, we've done it in our investment meetings, right? So, you know, we went from always being face-to-face -to, -face to all of a sudden, okay, well, now it's got to be virtual or on a conference call. Um, so... For us, it's, it's seeing that um, the industry, the um, community can adapt um, and understand what, what, how the transition is happening. And that's when I was talking about revolutionizing and changing the future of transportation from a commuter and commercial application. It's all about change. It's all about being successful in that change and being able to portray that and giving that good understanding of what that change is all about and what, what it is that we're all trying to do and making this a much better place and a sustainable place for everyone. Thanks, Paul. And, and finally, Dwayne, uh, if we fast forward two years from now, what does success look like for Workhorse? Oh, great question from the audience. Um, you know, I suppose there are varying ways to measure success, but boiling it down at Workhorse, I guess the measure is, you know, is the company doing what, what is right for its stakeholders, its customers, its employees, our suppliers, you know, and, and the environmental impact that we need to have, right, in such a manner consistent with the core values while we're producing a profit? I got to think about that question a little longer than... <laughs> Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, we got one more question from the audience here. I think we've got time for it. It's another group question, so more time to prep. Uh, can each member of the panel talk about the regulatory issues they may face on federal, state, and local levels and what they're doing to deal with that uh, or use it to their benefit? Maybe, Max, we'll start with you again. 
Um, let's see. So um, today, we, we, you know, every state is different. Um, the, 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 our cruiser scooter is fine in almost every state, but in North and South Carolina, it's a moped. It has no pedals. It doesn't travel 30 miles per hour. It doesn't require registration. It doesn't need a helmet, but that's an example of states have different laws. Um, within states, cities have different laws. Um, universities enforce, it's not a regulatory body, but on that campus, if you want to operate on that campus, you're going to go by their rules and regulations. So, so um, there are uh, uh, many deep pocketed companies who, who sway with, <laughs> with their lobbyists, what those laws are and how they can be um, changed to their benefit. Um, I think we're better off uh, working together to um, help move or change or adopt laws, in some cases, ancient laws, laws that the, 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 the law that I quoted in North South Carolina, it's been on the books for over hundred years. And it's just that it's not that the law that has, it should hold any merit. Um, technological innovations often get well out ahead of um, regulatory environments. And the regulatory environment needs to move and needs to adopt with technological improvement. And so that's going to be around for a while, certainly for us. And um, I, you know, I, I, I think we're making great progress. I think we have many great uh, uh, leaders um, who understand the challenges, both in city, local government, and state government. And uh, it took a long time for, for Cuomo to pass a law that enabled uh, uh, e-bikes and scooters in New York City. And uh, everyone who got food delivery and their Chinese food, it was always on an e-bike, but now it's legal. Um, so. Uh, Things are improving, but uh, we'll always be working uh, closely with the regulators to make sure that uh, we abide by them and, and change, help, hopefully can change laws when necessary. That's great. Thank you, Max. Uh, Al, over to you. What regulatory issues do you foresee or have you dealt with? Uh, so for the solo, it's considered a motorcycle for the United States, uh, which means that it's got benefits and then there are some other obstacles that we've had to overcome. So right now, 39 of the states, all you need is a driver's license in order to be able to drive the solo. And some of the other states are changing or in progress of, of changing that so that that's all you need. Uh, in terms of the, the benefits of, of it being classified as a motorcycle is that um, our total cost of ownership is a lot less compared to the other EVs, such as um, like the Mini, the Leaf, the Bolt, or the Tesla. Um, so over a five-year time frame, when you include insurance and, and maintenance costs and everything else like that, you know, it's about 36 to 96% less. Um, so it's very attainable in terms of purchase price and, and your overall cost. Um, the other aspect is you know, we don't have to, you don't have to insure the uh, solo as a vehicle, which the cost of insurance, again, is a lot more expensive. Um, whereas if you insure it as a motorcycle, it's, it's a lot less. Uh, we also have uh, rebates for the consumer in the state of um, California and the state of Washington, but um, we don't have a federal um, rebate that would be attributable, attributable to the solo, sorry, I'm having tongue-tied tongue -tied right now. <laughs> um, but uh, overall, we're, we're actually quite happy with the progress. And um, once we have our global vehicle uh, made, uh, then um, this will be open internationally uh, in terms of restrictions. Thanks, Belle. Uh, Dwayne, finishing with you, what regulatory issues have you encountered uh, in knowing your business too, what other ways you're using this to your advantage as well in terms of certifications or other ways to take advantage of that? Great question again. Um, you know, I would tell you first and foremost, there's a lot of, and I think everybody understands and actually appreciates it. There's a lot of regulatory to even put one medium duty vehicle on American roads, right? You, much less hundreds or thousands of those vehicles. So from a regulatory perspective, whether it's EPA, CARB, DOT, uh, federal motor vehicle safety standards and, and so on and so on and so on. It adds a significant amount of cost, if you will, uh, to companies like us who are innovative and in developing a product. But again, the appreciative side is this. We want to put very safe, 
very reliable uh, vehicles on the road that people are are safe in. They're not getting injured and hurt and killed and so on, right? So those guys have a very important, those regulatory agencies have a very important mission at hand. But what we're challenged with is the amount of capital it takes, right, to develop the solutions they very much want to be brought into, uh, whether it's federally or in, at the state level, uh, but the difficulty in which it is to, to accomplish those things against those incumbents, you know, who have the cash and the knowledge, the know-how and so on to navigate those waters. So we have been through this now that we're on generation two multiple times. And as you guys are aware, we announced, you know, over the last few months in our plan to production, the successful, um, uh, the successful passing, I'll say, or receiving of the appropriate certification, such as the EPA certification uh, to put our vehicles on American roads, uh, the CARB certification. So from a state level, there are basically 14 states, I'll call them, uh, that follow even stricter guidelines than the EPA has that are follow the CARB or the California um, uh, Air Resource Management Board, right? What they require for us. So our vehicles being all electric vehicles do have an advantage over any combustion engine vehicle, but it's interesting that those agencies are still really developing what the testing process needs to look like and so on. So they somewhat mimic what the combustion engines are. And you might answer a question of, you know, what kind of engines on board? Well, we don't have an engine on board, but you navigate through that. You put the vehicle through, you know, weeks, many weeks long worth of testing where they identify something as simple as, you know, how many miles does this vehicle get if it's got 100, and kilo, 100 kilowatt hours of energy on board? And then they literally produce a window sticker that provides the, the public that information. So regulatory wise, important because we want safe vehicles out there, right? Uh, but at the same time, you know, we'd like to see uh, the regulatory catch up with what we inventors are doing, if you will, so that we don't have to experience all those same types of things. Thanks, so Wayne. Uh, it looks like we're running up right at time as well. So thank you to everyone for submitting your questions. I'm sorry to those of uh, you we didn't get to today. To wrap up, though, I'd just like to thank our panelists once again for joining us today. We hope you all found the discussion as informative as we did. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about any of these companies, Gateway, uh, or our firm's technology practice, I would encourage you to reach out to our team at tmt at gateway.ir.com. Thanks and have a great rest of your day.